All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much to, for coming to this defense today. I'm mm -hmm. with Elso. She's going to be telling us about nesting trends of hawksbill sea turtles at Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge in St. Croix. Michaela first started working with us at Sandy Point in 2018. She came and worked on leatherback turtles with us for the season and got bitten by the turtle bug. She came back to visit the following year to volunteer for a couple of weeks. And then when an opportunity came to come to UVI and study turtles, she jumped at the chance. So she's done a lot of hard work in the last couple of years and she's gonna be telling you all about it today. All right, Michaela, you're up. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Um, first off, I just wanna make sure, can everybody on Zoom hear me okay and see my screen? We hear you fine. Thank you okay, for great. asking. Yeah, just checking to make sure because I'm going to put you guys away. So if anybody's making faces, I won't be able to see you. Feel free to message Sophie McKenzie if you're having any connectivity issues. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. let me just, yeah. sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah. If you um, are having any connectivity issues, you can message Sophia McKenzie and she can help you get that sorted out. So um, with that, I'll get started. Thank you all so much for being here today, both in person and virtually. Uh, it's been a really great opportunity to conduct this work, and I'm really, really excited to share all of this with you. So um, with that, I will just jump right into my presentation of my thesis work titled Nesting Trends of Hawksville Sea Turtles, Retmo Kelly's Imbricata at Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge in St. Croix, USVI. So just to get started with a bit of an introduction and um, a background about my species, um, which is the hawksbill sea turtle. Hawksbill sea turtles are globally distributed throughout the tropical and subtropical waters of the Atlantic, Pacific, and the Indian Oceans. They are most well known for being spotted in coral reef habitats, um, as one of their primary food sources are sponges, but they can often also be found in shallow coastal waters and in some regions of the world like the East Pacific can even be found inhabiting mangroves. Like all marine turtles, hawksbills typically don't reproduce every year, but instead will nest every two to four years on average. And during those nesting seasons, they will lay somewhere between three and five clutches of eggs before they leave their nesting beach and migrate back to their foraging grounds. Once those eggs hatch and the hatchlings emerge, they will move offshore to pelagic waters where they can sometimes be found taking shelter in floating algal mats and things like that. And they'll hang out in those pelagic waters for a number of years before recruiting to their foraging habitats as juveniles. Um, they will remain in those foraging habitats for a while until they reach sexual maturity, which for Caribbean hawksbills has been estimated to be between 14 and 24 years of age, but that range does vary by population. Hawksbills exhibit a behavior called natal Philopatry, which means that they return to their beach from which they were hatched in order to reproduce later as adults. Hawksbills have often been recorded nesting in um, un along undeveloped beaches and in sparse, past sparse patches of sand along rocky shores. And they're also very well known for their preference in nesting um, in areas with a lot of coastal vegetation. And when I say a lot of coastal vegetation, I mean it, we spent a lot of time at Sandy Point looking for these sneaky turtles in the vegetation. Like all marine turtles, hawksbills are federally protected in the United States and territories, and they were listed as critically endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature in 1968. Major threats to hawksbills include the usual suspects like habitat degradation, changing ocean conditions, uh, but the most notable threat for hawksbills specifically has been their historic harvest in massive numbers for their meat and for their beautiful shells. There have been numerous protections that have been implemented globally uh, since the late 20th century in order to reduce the exploitation of this species. However, populations are still significantly reduced throughout their range um, and estimated to be at only 25% of their pre-colonial numbers. In the Caribbean region specifically, there are a number of known nesting and foraging aggregations throughout the region, and you can see some of those here on this map. Most notably are some in Jumbie Bay, Antigua, in Barbados, the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula, and nearby Mona Island, Puerto Rico. Specifically in the U.S. Virgin Islands, hawksbills are, um, have been long monitored 
nesting at Buck Island Reef National Monument, which you can see from this map, sits off the northeast shore of the island of St. Croix. The project monitoring hawksbills at Buck Island has gone on since the late 1980s, um, and they've identified over 500 individuals to date. Hawksbills do nest elsewhere on the island of St. Croix, including at Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge, which is what we'll be discussing today. And they also do nest in lower densities on the other two islands um, of the USVI, St. Thomas and St. John. So coming back to my thesis and the goals for my work, hawksbills have been recorded nesting at Sandy Point for decades, but targeted work has been less consistent until recent years and a full investigation of the population has yet to be conducted. So with this in mind, I set out to compile all available records of hawksbills nesting at Sandy Point over the last 40 years. And by doing this, I hope to conduct a baseline assessment of the species historical use of Sandy Point as a nesting beach and to analyze trends in their nesting since data began being collected in 1981. So to do this, I set out to test three specific hypotheses. Uh, first, that there's been no detectable change in the number of hawksbill nests at Sandy Point since data began being collected in 1981 all the way to 2020. Secondly, I wanted to determine if there had been a detectable change in hawksbill nesting success at Sandy Point across that same study period. And one important thing to note about hawksbill nesting behavior is that they do often come up onto the beach and take a look around, but then they leave without ever actually nesting. And these occurrences are called false crawls. And they're really not that uncommon for marine turtles, especially not for hawksbills, um, but they can be an indicator of anything that's going on that they may be encountering that dissuades them from nesting. So to calculate the nesting success, I used the following equation, which you can see here, the number of nests divided by the total number of activities. And then I looked at the trends in those numbers um, over time to identify any changes. And then lastly, I wanted to determine if hawksbill nests are equally distributed across the three different beaches at Sandy Point, the Northwest and South beaches. And I wanted to determine if the nesting success was equal across those three beaches as well. So getting into a little bit about how the data had been collected, just to orient you all to my study site, Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge sits at the Southwest corner of the island of St. Croix, and it was established as a federally protected refuge in 1983. This designation was specifically for the protection of the leatherback sea turtles that have been monitored nesting there since the late 1970s, but also for the other two species of turtles that nest there, the greens and the hawksbills. The refuge is open to the public um, on weekends only from September through March. However, it's closed throughout the summer months completely in order for peak turtle nesting season. In total, Sandy Point encompasses 384 acres of protected lands and hosts about five kilometers of shoreline which is marked every 20 meters with a numbered stake for the sea turtle work that goes on out there. And while Sandy Point is known as the longest continuous beach in the US Virgin Islands, from this view especially, you can see those three distinct beaches that I mentioned earlier. And those are the South Beach, which is there at the top, is the longest of the three beaches at 2.8 kilometers. The North Beach there at the bottom, which is the second longest at 1.6 kilometers. And then the shorter West Beach there that connects the two at 0 0.6 kilometers. So to get in a little bit about how the data were collected, data on sea turtle nesting at Sandy Point have been collected through two primary surveys, um, the first of which is the morning track surveys. And now these surveys are conducted generally starting about sunrise, and they involve just surveying the entire length of the beach, looking for any turtle tracks or possible nesting activities that occurred from the night before. These surveys are generally conducted year round daily uh, during the peak season from July to October, and then about three times per week at least from November to March. The second type of survey where data were collected are the nighttime nesting surveys. And these are conducted during the peak turtle nesting season, which involve people being out on the beach from about 7 p.m. to 5 a.m.-ish, uh, looking for any turtles that are coming up onto the beach to nest. And in most years, these efforts were primarily targeted on leatherback nesting season, which occurs from about April to July. However, in recent years, uh, nighttime patrols have also been conducted during peak green and hawksbill season, which occurs in August and September. Once they were encountered, um, a turtle would be measured. She would be implemented with an external flipper tag and an internal pit tag for future identification and had some skin biopsies taken for genetic analysis. 
Any nests that were laid were documented and their location was recorded so that they could be monitored throughout their incubation period until they hatched. Now, before I get into the nitty gritty of my analysis, I want to describe some of the obstacles that I encountered in working with this long term data set and how I decided to address them going forward. So sea turtle monitoring efforts have been going on at Sandy Point for decades and have been managed by numerous groups and organizations across that time. And as a result, the data were not always collected in a standardized way or across the same time frames each year. So this just resulted in a lot of variability within year and across years um, in the data that's available. So before digging into this, I kind of just want to draw your attention to some of these major shifts in effort as they'll be important to my analysis later. So I know this is a table with a lot of dates and numbers, but I want to draw your attention just to the um, first and last dates of the um, sea turtle activity, uh, which would be a green hawksbill or a leatherback, any of the species. Um, and then this also shows the total number of survey days that were estimated annually, as well as the total number of survey days that occurred in what I will be referring to from here on out as my core nesting season. And that occurred from June 1st to October 31st. Additionally, I also have the um, number of Hawksville activities and number of Hawksville nests that were recorded annually. So from 1981 to 1992, the efforts were primarily focused on leatherbacks, as I mentioned. Um, however, you can see that some of these efforts were extended in through the fall months, at least through August. And I got a little lost here. Um, from the records that we can see here, there were just a few that uh, there were very few that were recorded in each year. Efforts were gradually expanded over the years to include more of the fall months for the green and Hawksville season, which you can see here starting in 1993, where the last recorded dates of activities occurred in December pretty regularly. And then we can also see that there is a clear shift in the total number of surveys that were conducted, as well as the number of activities that were recorded each year. And in a few years, records appeared to end in August, despite my knowledge that these surveys were actually conducted through those fall months, and that data was just unavailable to me at this time. And so I'm still on the hunt for these um, activity records, and I hope to have them added to my final analysis for publication. But for now, these years were noted, but ultimately kept in my analyses, as I didn't want to discount any of the available data that we had. The most important thing to note um, now is just that the data we do have meet the minimum data standards as were described by the State of the World Sea Turtles Advisory Board. And so I am confident that the numbers presented here today are the minimum number of activities that um, occurred at Sandy Point each year. And so moving on, efforts to standardize um, and expand these regular monitoring efforts through the end of the year continued, especially since 2009 which you can see here that surveys were extended through December in just about every year. And the number of Hawksbill activities and nests were much higher as well. So moving on to, to the analysis of my data, um, if you'll remember, my first hypothesis was looking at the trends in nest numbers across years. And my second hypothesis was looking at trends in nesting success across years. So to look at these, I used a simple linear model. And I also wanted to look at my data across three specific time frames, um, which are based on those shifts that I previously described. And so first I looked at all data available for all of the years, 1981 to 2020. My second time frame is um, leaving out those earliest of years when the data were limited and looking at just um, 1993 to 2020. And then my third and final, um, time frame was looking at that core nesting season, which again is June 1st through October 31st from 1993 to 2020. And then lastly, to address my final hypothesis, which you'll remember is um, looking at the frequency of nests and the distribution of nests across the three beaches at Sandy Point. I used a chi-square goodness of fit test and a chi-square test of independence to identify any differences in Hawksville nest density and nesting success between the Northwest and South beaches. So getting into my results, um, there were a ton of files that I had to get put together in order to analyze any of this data. And most of these files included hard copy data sheets, field notebooks, old Excel sheets, sometimes even just activities that were scribbled on pieces of notebook paper. Um, and so 
there was a lot of time put into organizing and digitizing these old files. And I wanna take a moment here to mention that there's no way that I would have been able to tackle all of this data without the help of my partner, Paige Kaufman. She was also in St. Croix last summer, um, looking through these same files for the green nesting activities um, across the last couple of decades. Um, and we spent a lot of hours together digitizing these hard copy files. So I just wanted to shout out to her for all of her help. There's no way we would have been able to do it uh, without together. So together, Paige and I compiled a total of 19,375 turtle records from 1981 to 2020. And 4,781 of those records were Hawksville activities. You can see from the graph here, these are the total number of activities per year with the count there on the left y-axis. And then also the red dotted line indicates the number of estimated survey days per year. And I just thought that this figure was really helpful in identifying and visualizing the number of activities throughout the years, as well as the efforts that were being expended in order to document them. Now, the number of activities ranged widely um, between the years from one in some of the earliest years to a peak of 574 in 2012. But on average, there were an, um, about 169 Hawksville activities that occurred at Sandy Point annually. Of those activities, um, almost 90% occurred between June 1st and October 31st, which is one of the reasons that um, I decided to define that core nesting season as between being between those two months. On a more individual level, there were a total of 141 individual Hawksville females that were identified throughout this study period. Of those 141, 62% were only encountered that single time of nesting and 21% were only encountered a second time. In 2011, the greatest number of Hawksville's was observed in one season, which has 37 individuals. And the oldest known Hawksville nesting at Sandy Point was first tagged in 1989 and last observed in 2014, which indicates a maximum known reproductive lifespan of at least 25 years. So now before I get into the um, analysis of my um, models and my trends, I wanted to orient you all to how I'll be presenting this data because it's gonna look the same across these next few slides. So I looked at trends in these three specific categories. I have trends in Hawksville activities, trends in Hawksville nests only, and trends in Hawksville nesting success. And I wanted to look at these three categories across those three time scales that I previously mentioned. And again, those were the all data available for all years, 1981 to 2020, 1993 to 2020, and then that core nesting season only for 1993 to 2020. And to avoid making these, whoops, sorry, Zoom, getting mixed up here. To avoid, here we are, to avoid making my model figures um, a little bit wordy, I will be denoting all these time frames with the letters A, B, and C, and they will look the same um, in format across these next couple of slides. So getting started with the historical trends and the number of Hawksville activities, the first model looking at 1981 to 2020 indicated the greatest increase across time with an average annual increase of Hawksville activities of 20%. Looking at the um, scale from 1993 to 2020 indicated a much lower but still statistically significant increase in activities with an annual average of 7.0%. Uh, and then lastly, looking at that core nesting season from 1993 to 2020, it indicated a slightly greater and still significant increase of 7.8% annually. Moving on to look at the total um, Hawksville nests and the trends across time. The first model from 1981 to 2020, again, indicated the greatest increase across time with 16.5% annually. When moving on to look at just 1993 to 2020, again, the model indicated a much um, lower but still significant increase of an average of 4.5% annually. And then lastly, looking at the core nesting season from 1993 to 2020, the model indicated a similar increase with an average of 4.6% annually. And for my final model, looking at the trends in Hawksville nesting success across time, the um, first model, the one looking at 1981 to 2020, indicated a slight decrease, but was not significant. 
However, the other two models looking at 1993 to 2020, and then the core nesting season in 1993 to 2020 indicated the same slight decrease of 0.8% annually. So now moving on to look at the um, frequency and density of nests at each of the three beaches in Sandy Point. The South Beach had the greatest overall frequency of nests across this time period. However, it did have the lowest density of nests at 10.3 nests per kilometer. The North Beach had just slightly fewer nests overall, but had the highest density of nests at 17.9 nests per kilometer. And then the West Beach, the shortest of the three beaches, had the least number of nests overall, but had a pretty similar nest density to the North Beach at 17.3 nests per kilometer. And now, of course, from this graph, it may look like there is a significant difference between some of these beaches, but of course, I have to confirm that with some statistics. So in my chi-square analysis indicated that there was a significant difference in the frequency of Hawksville nests across the three beaches at Sandy Point. Additionally, the chi-square analysis indicated that there was a significant difference between the nest density at the three beaches. And then finally, a chi-square test again indicated that there was a significant difference in the nesting success of the Hawksbills. However, this difference was only significant between the north and south beaches, not between the north and west or the south and west beaches. So real quick before getting into um, the discussion and the whys, just to summarize some of my results for you, a total of 4,781 Hawksville records were compiled from 1981 to 2020. And most of those activities occurred between June and October. Overall, there were 141 individual females identified and the longest time between the first and last encounter of a single individual was 25 years. When looking at activities, all three of my models indicated that there was a significant increase in the number of Hawksville activities annually. And my most confident model, which is the um, core nesting season from 1993 to 2020, indicated an annual average increase of 7.8%. When looking at the number of nests across years and trends in those numbers, again, all three of my models indicated that there was a significant increase. And my most confident model indicated that there was an average annual increase of 4.6%. Looking at the nesting success, if you'll remember, the only the two models looking at data from 1993 to 2020 indicated that there was a small decrease of less than 1% annually um, in nesting success at Sandy Point. And then lastly, looking at the beach aspect and the different uses of the um, three beaches for Hawksville nesting activities, all three of my chi-square analyses indicated that there was a significant difference across the three beaches and indicated that the North Beach had the highest nesting density as well as the greatest nesting success of all three of the beaches. So with these results in mind, we have to wonder what is causing these increasing trends. And one possible explanation for this may be the increase in the uh, global and regional conservation measures that have been established since the late 20th century. Hawksbills are widely regarded as one of the most traded um, of all marine species, and there's been an estimated 9 million hawksbills that were harvested between 1844 and 1992. This figure here you can see shows a graph or a map of the world with some of those trade routes defined as well as some of the um, numbers of hawksbills that were traded across the across the world and you can see that a great number of them are being imported into Japan and then exported from the Caribbean region. In the Caribbean region, the most notable protection that was established was the um, end of the Cuban hawksbill trade in 1993 after they joined the Convention on International Trade for Endangered Species. And Cuba was a significant exporter of Hawksville products to Japan throughout the 20th century. And you can see that in this figure here with those huge arrows. And the end of this trading partnership signaled a really great turning point for this species, um, reducing the exploitation across the world. Now the increases that are presented here today for Sandy Point are not just limited to Sandy Point, um, and they've also been seen elsewhere throughout the Caribbean region. There are some other notable populations that experienced increases in annual nesting and in population numbers, some of which can be seen here in this table. And these data were collected over somewhat similar timescales as well. 
So you can see in this table the comparisons of the annual number of nests between locations, as well as the um, average annual estimated increase in nesting activities in these locations. And they range from anywhere from 4.6% at Sandy Point to as high as 20.8% in Barbados. And many of these populations attribute their significant increases to the established protections um, that have been implemented since the late 20th century. And many of them often also specifically identify the end of the Cuban Hawksbill trade as a significant turning point. It is important to note, however, that not all populations are doing as well. And there are many populations that are still suffering from depleted, pop, uh, depleted numbers. And there are a number of locations that have a significant lack of available data. And that makes it really difficult to un understand or estimate the status of Hawksbills in the region. In these populations, though, these trends indicate that conservation measures may be working and that the efforts expended should be um, expanded to include more of the region and to gather more information on the status of hawksbills throughout their range. In contrast to the increasing trends and in activities that we saw, um, we did see a slight decrease in the nesting success of hawksbills over the years. However, this decrease was relatively minor at less than 1%. And on average, hawksbills exhibit an, um, a nesting success of about 50%, which is one nest per two uh, false crawls. And that number is similar to other populations in the region. Like I mentioned before, false crawling is not uncommon um, and it can be influenced by many factors or it could just be a random behavior. You know, maybe the female came up on the beach and she just did not like the vibe and she decided that she was going to try again later. So at this time, the decreasing trends are not um, as much of a concern. However, we will continue to collect data and monitor the situation further to identify any decreases in the future. When considering the factors that could be influencing Hawksbill preferences in beach aspect, there are, you can see from this map that there, the three beaches are facing different cardinal directions. And they also have um, very different nearshore environments and wave action and nearshore currents that influence the shape of the beach. And on the ground, these differences are even more stark. So the North, West, uh, North Beach is wide and sandy, and it has a minimal amount of vegetation. The West Beach is also a bit wide, but has a lot more of debris and sargassum that's deposited. And it also experiences annual erosion cycles. So it's growing and waning throughout the year. And then the South Beach is the longest of the three beaches. And it also has a lot of vegetation and debris similar to the West Beach due to some offshore currents. But in 2017, Hurricane Maria blew, uh, blew through right off the southern shoreline of St. Croix and um, removed a ton of vegetation, which has led to the gradual erosion of this beach over the last few years. Now, these physical characteristics likely influence these nesting females' um, decisions when they're choosing a nest site. And if you'll remember, the north and the south beaches had similar frequencies of nests overall, but their density of nests per kilometer was very different. And it's possible that the hawksbills may have wished to nest on the south shore, maybe because it had that vegetation that they're known for preferring, but the lack of stability and the steep scarps that have been um, generated through the erosion these past few years may have made that site unsuitable. The North Beach is a lot more stable, experiences a lot less wave action, and therefore is probably a better bet when nesting female is looking for her prime nesting spot. So when thinking about these individuals across time and what that can tell us, before 2020, tagging efforts were limited to opportunistic encounters during the leatherback seasons, and also just to two um, targeted seasons for hawk spills that occurred in 2011 and 2012. And without more data on the re-encounters of these individuals across time, it's really difficult to determine any population size or estimate population parameters um, like survival or remigration intervals. And the longest known period between the first and last sighting of a female was 25 years. And based on estimates of age to maturity, which is 14 to 24 years for Caribbean hawksbills, we could estimate that this turtle was at least 39 years old at the time of her last sighting in 2014. And that's assuming that she was tagged during her very first nesting season in 1989. So this significant time span may indicate the high survival of females nesting at Sandy Point which is a really important indicator of the stability of a population over time. 
And the need for this kind of data in order to further characterize our population just goes to support the argument that long-term monitoring efforts are really necessary in order to monitor these populations. So the results of the study are promising and the significant increases in net activities and nests reported here indicate that Sandy Point may support a very regionally um, significant nesting population of hawksbills. And the increase in protections and um, in the region and internationally have likely contributed significantly to the recovery of the species overall. But there is still a lot of work that needs to be done as there are still many threats that these turtles face throughout their range. In the Caribbean specifically, legal harvest still exists for cultural practices and subsistence, and illegal harvest and trade remains a problem due to lack of enforcement in many areas. Additionally, bycatch in commercial fisheries gear has been identified as the greatest threat to hawksbills currently, as it's estimated that between 5,000 and 17,000 nesting females are lost every year due to entanglement. So due to the migratory nature of this species, these conservation efforts must be comprehensive and cooperative on a regional and global scale in order to further reduce um, any losses of these populations. When considering these results on a global scale, hawksbill populations have been designated to 13 different regional management units or RMUs. And some of those can be seen here on this map from a publication by Wallace et al in 2010. And these RMUs were established in order to better understand how efforts can be targeted um, for conservation on a larger scale, as these turtles are often migrating across numerous international boundaries. Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge is a part of RMU 10, which includes all populations in the wider Caribbean and in the Western Atlantic. And according to Wallace, Hawksville populations are listed as experiencing long-term declines in this region. Most specifically, the USVI populations are listed as experiencing short-term increases. However, they are um, experiencing long-term trends that are unknown. And this research presented here today um, through my thesis may begin to fill some of those um, unknown gaps in information as they indicate that Sandy Point has been experiencing a steady increase in their nest numbers annually for the last few decades. So six of the 10 priorities that have been identified for hawksbills are related to the identification and uh, monitoring and protection of their critical nesting habitats. And with this research, I was able to fill very important knowledge gaps related to the use of San, uh, Sandy Point as a nesting habitat for hawksbills. And as a result of this work, we were able to identify that Sandy Point is likely emerging as a very important nesting population in the region and specifically for the US Virgin Islands. Recent work in 2018 indicated that the nesting population at Sandy Point is genetically distinct from the population that's nesting at Buck Island Reef National Monument, which is just a mere 40 kilometers away. And this has really important implications for future management and for informing our understanding of how populations throughout the region are interconnected. For example, the hawksbills born on Buck Island have been identified as contributing significantly to the foraging populations at nearby Mona Island in Puerto Rico. And Buck Island hawksbills have also been identified as being genetically linked to populations in Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and the windward coast of Barbados, while the hawksbills nesting at Sandy Point have been linked to populations in Antigua, the leeward coast of Barbados, and Cuba. So it's important to note that all these populations are intermingling and linked in various ways, and the increases and decreases of any of these populations may result in similar changes elsewhere. And therefore, the protection of nesting beaches alone is not sufficient for the protection of this species throughout its range. So in conclusion, this study serves as the first comprehensive analysis of hawksbill activities at Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, the increasing trends in hawksbill nest numbers were observed, and the North Beach was identified as having the greatest nest density per kilometer and the greatest nesting success across the three beaches at Sandy Point. The results and the continuation of uh, monitoring efforts over time will establish Sandy Point as one of the most well-documented hawksbill nesting populations in the region, alongside those in Barbados and Antigua, Mona Island and Buck Island. Um, so that is really, really important as well. And at this time, the importance of these long-term monitoring efforts really cannot be overstated. Um, in order to accurately assess changes in populations of a long-lived species like sea turtles, 
it's really important that these data be collected consistently over many, many years. And there's still a lot that we don't know about this population at Sandy Point, and therefore further documentation will only serve to better understand it. So looking forward, the nesting population at Sandy Point should be considered and managed as an independent population. Uh, in previous years, the nesting population at Buck Island has been the source of information for USV, USVI hawksbills when considering local and regional um, management efforts. But this study res, uh, indicates that the nesting population at Sandy Point likely supports just as many, if not more, nesting hawksbills than Buck Island, and therefore it should be considered alongside Buck Island for any future um, assessments of the status of hawksbills in the Virgin Islands. And then finally, and most importantly, Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge should be recognized as an index nesting beach. And this, identify, uh, this identification would allow Sandy Point to be recognized as a significant location for hawksbills in the region. And its addition to comprehensive studies of hawksbills would aid in better informing local and regional conservation strategies. So at this time, I would like to thank my committee members, Kelly, Paul, and Claudia for their endless support. Um, I would also like to extend a very special thank you to Mike Evans, the refuge manager at Sandy Point uh, for letting me dig through all of his file cabinets and also endlessly supporting me through this effort. Uh, I would like to thank my funding sources, especially Dr. Larry Wood at the National Save the Sea Turtle Foundation. And I would like to extend a huge thanks to all of those that were involved in the management and continuation of the monitoring efforts at Sandy Point across these years. And this list is definitely not all inclusive. There are so, so many more people that should be listed, but um, there's no way that this work could have been done without the countless hours and miles put in by all of these people. So I'd like to say thank you to them. And of course, I would like to thank my parents, my family, my boyfriend, Sean, everybody, my MMES 2020 cohort, uh, I could not have done this entire experience without your support. So with that, I thank you all for your attention and for joining me today, and I will take any questions. Excellent job, Michaela. Very good. Um, I do want to mention that we have an event survey that I'll post the links to in the chat if you all can take a moment to fill that out. I'd love 100% participation and for everyone in the room, I'll send you links by email. Um, and then so we'll take the next few minutes to answer questions from the room and from chat, and then we will say goodbye and have a closed committee session for Michaela and her committee members. I did see a question pop into the chat. I'll just go ahead and answer that or ask that one. It was from Patrick from USGS. Uh, well done. We had to drop off for another meeting, had a question. Have you identified hypotheses for the small but significant decline in nesting success? Invasive species, predation? Yeah, so I think that, like I mentioned, there are a lot of things that could influence the nesting success across time. Um, it could be the changes in beach morphology between years, changes in the available vegetation, or just some sort of random behavior. Um, I think that at this time, that decline does not um, concern me. It may even be attributed to um, an error in the collection of data across time, whether it was a false crawl or not, or a species or something along, that, along those lines. Um, and so I think just further collecting that data and uh, maybe taking some more information about those specific changes in the physical characteristics of the beach could be really helpful in identifying some further questions that we can ask about that. And of course, if it continues to increase um, in further years, then we will investigate it further. Yeah, Amber. Hi. Hi. Was wondering, and I know that this is probably like a really big thing, and you're gonna think that this is a terrible idea, and you don't wanna do it. But have you <laughs> looked at the differences in how people have surveyed the beach? Like, if they're going all the way around, I know that you guys switched to mm -hmm. the ATVs, like mm -hmm. maybe not doing the whole night. Mm -hmm. Did you look into any of that? Yeah, so, um. Just to repeat Amber's question, she was asking about if there, if I had looked into the differences in survey effort and how we conducted those surveys across the years. Um, and the answer is yes, we did try to look into that. Um, and as I mentioned before, just because it's been conducted by so many people across the years, like 
the focus and the goals and the priorities of each of those teams that were out there kind of varied between years. And another thing that I didn't mention in my presentation, but is important, um, is that we, we being Kelly, who is the data master at Sandy Point now, has really, really pushed for this very specific standardization of effort. You know, we're including the stake numbers that we walked between so we can get an accurate estimate of how far we're going and how many sections of the beach are being covered. But that information is not available for a lot of the earliest years. They just say we were there all night. Um, and so, you know, we can make the best estimates possible that the beach was totally covered. Um, but at, with the available information that I have right now, it's not um, not easy to get that all sorted out. It's very, very different between years. Um, so I think that that is very important. And then with the continuation of the data collection, the way that Kelly has set it up from here on out will do a really, really great job at allowing us to answer some of those further questions um, with including effort that we weren't able to this time around. Yes, Kayla. Awesome job. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for helping me with them. <laughs> um, I have a question. Like, obviously, you did all this great science, and it's really cool. And I think it sounds like Sandy Point's already embedded in some of the manage management mm -hmm. that's going on with Locksville. But I'm wondering how you see this like fitting into potential management action sure changing things with box filter if you, if you think it needs to change. sure so i think that the most important thing that could change is that that identification of sandy point as an index nesting beach and what that means specifically is just that it will be included as an independent population when people are doing these large-scale um, assessments of the status of Hawksville in the region and so currently um, if you go to the 2013 um, National Marine Fishery Service, like estimate status population, um, status assessment of populations. Um, they list Buck Island as its own little row in the number, like where they talk about the trends. And then underneath it, it just says USVI other. And that currently is where Sandy Point sits. And so I think that bringing Sandy Point to its own byline in that data um, will bring others to know that there's a lot of activity happening here and that it should be monitored. And I don't, I mean, I think these trends are really promising. I think that they look really great. Um, they're increasing steadily and hopefully that those trends continue. And uh, the other population or the other two populations at Sandy Point as well have also um, been sort of assessed in detail. And so I think that this information just goes to further establish Sandy Point as a successful conservation effort, the protection of it keeping it as pristine as it is because it's closed throughout so much of the year, um, it supports really important habitat. So I think just making Sandy Point its own individual will just further that. Yeah. Yes. So I was wondering about data from foraging populations mm -hmm. uh, and what's happening in coral reefs and mm -hmm. how that, because all you're talking about is nesting. Yes. How that all gets together. Yeah. So. so Question. Yeah, yeah. So the question was asking about just what, what the foraging populations are doing, you know, because my data is focused mostly on the nesting beach and none of the in water stuff. So at Sandy Point specifically, there's not turtle, there's not hawksbills that are foraging around there. Um, Buck Island does support some foraging habitat. So there have been some in water telemetry work um, and efforts to see what the turtles are doing when they're in that area. Um, but I think that any information about where they are going in this area, you know, maybe if we were able to monitor some of the individuals from Sandy Point specifically, we might be able to see where they're headed um, and where they are foraging. At this time, I am not 100% sure, but I do know that I was mentioning earlier, Buck Island supports a ton of the foraging population at Mona. So maybe if their turtles are going that way, then maybe our turtles are as well. Uh, question yeah. for Paul came in on the chat. Mm -hmm. What result surprised me the most? That's a tough question because all of it, I felt like I was very excited and surprised the entire time. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know if this is really a, a result of the study, but I think just the, the final result of the compilation of all of this data was shocking to me. Uh, I mean, when I came in and Kelly was like, we have all of this Hawksville data and we just like need someone to do something with it. And I was like, oh, sure, like I'll do some data entry and I'll, you know, put all that together, make a nice Excel spreadsheet. But it it's a massive amount of data and it's really um, 
it's humbling, I guess, is a good word for it to see all of the work that's been put in at Sandy Point across all of these years. Um, and so being able to compile all of that into a usable um, interface, if you will, for my work and then for anyone that comes after me that's interested in the Hawksville stuff, um, I think that was, I was just surprised and shocked by all of that effort that had been put in and how much it was able to tell me and how much more it still could probably tell us from here. Amber. Way more foreign question. Did you just use Excel or did you use a different program to enter in all of this data? So we actually, oh yeah, and Amber asked um, if we just used Excel to enter all of our data or if we used like a different program. And um, Kelly, again, data wizard. Uh, she analyzes or she like has created this really great system using an um, electronic survey form to um, help with the standardization of this effort. And so when our volunteers are out on the beach, they have this form on their phone and they're able to enter information from their activities and stuff via that. So she made a similar type form for Paige and I so that we were able to just sit down and, you know, go through. We had just notebooks with like lines. Every single line in that page was just a different activity. Um, so we did do some of it through Excel, but then we also used that electronic survey form, which was so helpful because then you can just download it to Excel after you've entered everything and it already comes out all pretty and organized. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So it sounds like Sandy Point is like a really special, amazing place. Like you can't, you can't go there. Like you can't go there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that seems like it's probably pretty rare for nesting beaches in yeah. general. So I'm wondering if you have a sense that if, like places that are, are potentially more disturbed, if you would mm -hmm. expect to see similar results where you hmm. see increasing nesting activity, or is this something that is potentially unique to this like undisturbed area? Yeah. Yeah, so Kayla asked if, if Sandy Point is kind of unique in that it's closed to the public throughout most of the year. Um, and you know whether or not a place that maybe isn't close to the public would be seeing similar trends. I think that's a really hard question because I think that Sandy Point, like you said, is really special and it is open throughout the peak nesting season for Hawksbills and Greens. Again, it is just on the weekends. So even the other five days of the week, it's still very quiet. Um, and so I do think that that provides a unique opportunity for them to be less disturbed, but I don't know. I'm trying to think of other places that I know of and when the other places that come to mind are like Buck Island or Mona. And I know that those places are protected as well. And Buck Island especially is really hard to get to. You have to like take a boat. Um, and there, you know, I think that, I think that the Hawksbills are pretty hardy individuals um, and they do enjoy, they're not as, um, I don't know what the right word is, particular about their sand and stuff like leatherbacks if they like touch a rock in the sand they're done they don't like it they want it only open sand and hawksbills you know they're sometimes digging in the sand or the dirt and rocks and trees and plants and stuff and so i think that disturbance by like either disturbance of like the physical characteristics of the beaches through foot traffic or from people and stuff like that i think maybe they wouldn't be as worried but they are pretty skittish so i know that if in terms of people being around i think that they maybe would have a harder time getting their business done. But I don't know. I would have to think I have to think a little bit more about that and do some comparisons with populations that are like on, you know, public open access beaches. I think Sandy Point is so special and it's such a I'm such I'm so biased towards it. I really really love it. It's my favorite place in the world. And so I'm just like Sandy Point's great. And there's, you know, this give and take between um it being open and being accessible to people because of course I just want to share it with people I'm like oh Sandy Point is beautiful it's so clean I want everyone to experience it but then also at the same time I love that it is closed because it provides that really natural habitat for turtles which I don't think is as common elsewhere as I wish it were so I don't know I just think it's great <laughs> Mm, any more questions? Oh, yes. Job, comments in the chat. I don't see nope. Um, any other questions? Nope. Okay. I have one question. Yeah, go ahead, about, Sophia. Um, the lifespan, you said 25 years mm -hmm. or for the reproductive span. That we know. Mm -hmm. Is that common? Were you able to compare that to any other population? So 
it seems to be that um, some of the most recent studies I've read have estimated that they can live as long as 50 to 60 years. And that was based on some like skeletal analysis that they did. Um, it's really hard to estimate the age or the reproductive life of marine turtles because you never see them and you can't really tell that information unless you can see all their insides. Um, and so, and this is a question that actually Andrew and I were just talking about the other day is whether or not they experience like reproductive cessation. Like, do they get to an age where they just stop um, and then, you know, they continue living and contributing um, or not. And so I think that for some other regions, this is pretty um, on par with what they have seen as well and other long-term tagging efforts. But I think that just that one single turtle isn't enough to make that comparison for the whole population. I would hope that we would be able to get some more information um, to like answer that question in more detail. Yeah, but it's a long time. I mean, that's, you know, if they do live to 50, that's half their life, you know? So it's a good, a good period of time. Okay, well. <laughs> you did great. <laughs> oh, Claudia, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Claudia asked if it's still my favorite place at three o'clock in the morning when it's pouring rain and you have sand in your pants. And I said, <laughs> yes, it absolutely is. Um, Honestly, that's the best part. <laughs> well, I would like to thank everybody that attended on Zoom. I see so many of my friends and family um, that were able to be here today. I really, really appreciate you guys tuning in. And I would like to thank everybody that came today. This is really great. And yay, I don't know. It's <laughs> All right, I guess for now, I will say goodbye to everyone on Zoom. Bye, my friends and family. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I got invited. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Okay. Claudia and I are still on Zoom. Uh, we can go to a different Zoom, or if everyone else is off, then we can just. Sorry, Paul, you were talking, but I had my thing muted. Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I just saying that okay, uh, Claudia and I are on Zoom. So if we can just leave this um, open, that would be great. And um, I'm not sure. Sure. If Sophia is going to be able to transfer the uh, it to me, or else she needs to be able to stay on, so we can sort of record and then stop recording and then record and stuff like that. So, Sophia, do you know if you can uh, transfer that power to me? I think I just did. Ah, okay. And it's like, oh, for some reason. Oh, you, yeah, you made me uh, the host, so that's great. And okay. and you are also co host so. Yeah, you may want to stop the recording, and then if you want to record the committee session, you can. Um, and I can send you the link. It might go up. Or no, it should go on.